humbled and honored to have this opportunity to introduce Amiri. It's a second time around for me and it doesn't get any easier. So uh, I just want to warn you, this is a real introduction. So I'm, I, I really thought through this. If performance, image, object, and sound, and sound making are forms of knowledge, then what we now call art gives us a unique view of how things in the world are or are not responded to. In 1944, the great Martinican poet Aimé Césaire wrote, poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. He also wrote, what presides over the poem is not the most lucid intelligence, the sharpest sensibility, or the subtlest feelings, but experience as a whole. That same year, Césaire's student, Franz Fanon, perhaps aspiring to also become a writer, found himself in Algeria as a French soldier and was horrified by what he experienced. It would lead him to become one of the 20th century's most innovative psychiatrists, its most important theorist of race and colonization, and an Algerian revolutionary. On this side of the Atlantic, in the only hemisphere so thoroughly dispossessed that not one state officially uses a native language, bebop had already come into being, a phenomenon that Jack Kerouac called the language of America's inevitable Africa, expressing the enormity of a new world philosophy. In 1944, Kerouac met Allen Ginsberg, and poet Robert Duncan published The Homosexual in Society, announcing a new doctrine of human liberation that would also ensure his continued unrecognition as one of the century's greatest poets. In 1944, alerted to changes in US policy in which Nazis and war criminals got filtered through the OSS and State Department to become key policymakers and scientists, Charles Olson resigned from his post at the Office of War Information to become, of all things, a poet. Just some months before that, in a trial in Alabama over his status as a conscientious objector in the Second World War, Herman Poole Blount, known as Sonny and later Sun Ra, did the unthinkable and unheard of. He told a white judge in the Deep South that if he was forced to learn how to kill, he would use that skill without prejudice and kill one of his own <laughs> captains or generals first. The judge said, I've never seen a nigger like you before. <laughs> to which Sonny replied, no, and you never will again. <laughs> a response that immediately landed him in jail. His psychiatric report echoed those of Lester Young, Charlie Parker, Bud Powell, Charles Mingus, and so many others, in which he was described as a psychopathic personality, but also a well-educated colored intellectual who was subject to neurotic depression and sexual perversion. These are the over and undercurrents of the world Amiri Baraka grew up in. Born Everett Leroy Jones in Newark, New Jersey, where Amiri's son Raz is running for mayor, keep an eye on that election, very important election. Uh, in 1934, Baraka's importance and multiple legacies are truly mammoth. In a review of a book on Billy the Kid, Charles Olson wrote, what strikes one about the history of said states U.S., both as it has been converted into story and as there are those who are always looking for it to reappear as art. What has hit me is that it does stay unrelieved. This sense of the unrelieved and the pressures that brings to bear on what poet Ed Dorn called this permissive asylum is enormous, and we know that the past can't simply disappear. Given the circumstances of destroyed languages and peoples, slavery and layered diasporas, we have a human, political, and cultural amalgam on this continent as dense and complicated as any the world has ever known. The explosion of expression following World War II, bebop, abstract expressionism, the new American poetries, the black arts movement, free jazz, Afrofuturism, and a host of other groupings and labels is a massive response to this complexity and represents an era of creativity that measures up to any known age of accomplishment we can think of. At the same time, facing the academic, ideological, and political straitjackets of the Cold War, 
These artists were first and foremost thinkers, and their work constitutes a vast realm of hardly explored concepts about the world we actually live in. Amiri Baraka is one of a handful of the remaining key representatives of this era, and his personal, artistic, and political life cuts through every significant intersection of the age. There are no other living American writers able to traverse the traditional generic trio of poetry, prose, and drama, then move into the realms of essay, criticism, autobiography, and scholarship while making an authoritative mark in each form. In fact, if we take the great British scholar Gordon Brotherston's definition that the prime function of a classical text, the prime function of a classical text is to construct political space and anchor historical continuity, then Amiri Baraka, Baraka is one of our truly classical writers. His disruptive and political practice refuses to conform to style or manner, allowing imagination to roam between the placard and the eulogy, between eyewitness reports stating facts and cosmic journeys reinstating the kinship of souls. He has both been anchoring historical continuity and redrawing the political boundaries of time and space, first in Newark, New Jersey, then in New Ark, Out and Gone, an otherworldly place through which he channels radio shows, movies, street banter, memories, diatribe, drama, scholarly study, fable, fiction, science fiction, investigative poetics, calculated public rhetoric, and on-the-spot reporting. He is a fantastic witness, both to the astonishing unreality of the daily real and an example of what can be done to respond to it. He has constantly exposed himself and his ideas to public scrutiny, even attack, opening a window into participation in the amalgamation of selves and ideas that form the creative political subject, that is, ourselves. Amiri's example has served as a constant reminder that such selves, ideas, forms, even communities are won through struggle and confrontation with oneself and the world. They're not cheaply packaged and exchangeable things to pick up or drop for personal gain or according to dictates of fashion. Finally, this clarity of purpose rests in a stance, a position, a place one has come to in consciousness and over which there can be no negotiation. The visibility of such a stance bound to a real historical context, a real place, is itself a call to action, to activate those parts of one's own consciousness and meet such a challenge in like terms. In recent years, Amiri has been quite explicit about the need to emphasize and carry on his diverse legacies, and they are quite diverse and important. He has been extraordinarily generous in working, for instance, with the Lost and Found Project. This began with a small collection of letters between him and Ed Dorn, finally resulting in the complete correspondence out next month from the University of New Mexico. Most recently, Amiri has lent his support to Il Grupo, a gathering of writers initially convened to debunk a recent book claiming that Charles Olson was an exemplar of US imperialism and that projective verse was based on a military paradigm. In that somewhat macabre light, because Amiri actually published projective verse, meaning that if Olson is a big imperialist, perhaps by association Amiri is a small one, in that macabre light, let us, without further ado, give it up for Amiri Baraka. Yeah, I was up here a couple of times to see Charles and uh, discuss the past and the future <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> and so this little small essay of mine, I read, and uh, probably a couple of poems, because if you're a poet, you have to read poetry, otherwise you lose your license, you know? <laughs> So, this is called Charles Olson and Sun Ra, a note on being out. Uh, I wrote a book recently called, um, what is it called? Notes on the Out and the Gone. And that was a big expression in the 60s 
you know, something was out, somebody was out. That means they were not the usual. They were out. If you cannot make the connection that is between Olson and Sun Ra, you cannot understand the typology of that time in which they and some of us live. Both are older than most of those they influence. Olson born 1910, Worcester, Massachusetts. Sun Ra, 1914, Birmingham, Alabama. Likewise, their careers, in quotes, were their lives and the changes they went through and influenced us to make. Olson began as an ascendant in the academic world, success, until his PhD thesis on Melville, when, with the help of a Guggenheim, he dropped out. And with World War II, became Assistant Chief of Foreign Language Division, Office of War Information. <laughs> From there, into politics on the Democratic Party's National Committee, and chafing at the restriction and incompetence and bureaucracy, he drops out of there. His, verse, his first book was an extension of the PhD thesis, but much differently formed. Uh, that's called, the book that came out of that was called Call Me Ishmael, The Brief Study of Herman Melville and Shakespeare and America. Later, he became the rector at Black Mountain College, which was a nurturer both of Olson and an emerging American avant-garde in literature, painting, sculpture, dance, music from 1948 until its closing in 1956. Olson didn't start writing a public poetry until he was 35. But even in the Ishmael, Olson told out his challenging summary of who and where we are. And he says, quote, I take space, big letters, I take space to be the central fact to man born in America from Folsom Cave to now. I spell it large because it comes large here, large and without mercy, unquote. So Olson's take on America first is space. It's big, space, you know. Uh, it's not a little island like England, you know. It's <laughs> a huge place. Uh, that idea he comes to again in his poems, his grandly instructive essays, the essay Projective Verse, which I've published, which first appeared in 1950, I published as a small pamphlet with a press that I had created called Totem Press in 1959. You know. In this essay, which I feel changed the direction of poetry in the US for many young poets writing in the 50s and 60s, Olson urges the poet to stop using the closed forms of formal U.S. verse and also England. That is, quit using those closed poetic forms. That's, that was the main thrust of that, you know. Uh, it says, particularly, stop using the dead, inherited detritus of English poetry. That a new American poetry must be built on the ear, the breath, the sound of the poet would be composition by feel rather than an overused, inherited, largely academic, usually iambic form. It would askew form as a fixed object. See, that's the, that was the key. It would askew form as a fixed object into which one poured a poem, thereby shearing away the spontaneous projectile percussive perspective. Those are his quotes, quote, projective I mean, projectile, percussive, perspective, unquote, poetic incident caused by heart, breath, sound, and the syllable itself. Now, these were very, very great concepts to us in the 50s and the 60s because they released us from the need to follow what we thought was dead, corny, you know, uh, English forms and those American forms. <laughs> We thought it was the death of academic poetry. Little did we understand. <laughs> you know. In other words, the poem should not be contained in a box of dead preconsideration. The feel was the open space of all life and memory. The poem should be open and an experience of opening. That is, it should be open and it should open your mind, your heart an experience of opening the heart to the mind. 
And he says here, quote, and this was much quoted by everybody, one perception must move instanter upon another. That's a quote. One perception must move instanter upon another, instant by instant by instant. That is, you perceive and perceive and perceive and perceive. It's not one thing. The poem is moving. It's moving as you're moving, breathing, hearing. And then Robert Creeley, the great poet, was an extension of that, also another Black Mountain person. Quote, form is never more than an extension of content, unquote. Form is never more than an extension of content. That is, turn it around, you know. Don't use the form to contain. The content must be principle. And any, any of these people, these formalists, and they f abound everywhere, they always want to tell you that the form is principle. It's not the form that's principle, it's the content. What are you saying? You know, like you always say that to people, but well, what are you saying? And that's what we want from the art. What are you saying? You know. One of these early Maximus poems begins, quote, it was he, the figure of outward, he was there. He was the figure of outward extension, opening, you know. Uh, mentioned in some connection to Robert Creeley, who in his own way was out. And the poem Maximus, projected from where the poet himself lived, Gloucester, a poem describing the place and coming into it of itself, self-creation but also the going out, the observations of the poet, which included the nation, the world, all of history, natural, and human. The poem breaks down the restrictions of the literary close verse, but even the form of its composition, reflecting newly the typewriter's use of creating a score, like a musical score. The lines are not like that. They're how you hear them, da, 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 da according to your breath, which Ginsburg uh, set me on to when I first came to New York. It is the breath phrase. That was William Carlos Williams talking, the breath phrase. What is, your, what is your natural breath phrase? When you talk, where do you stop to breathe? You know, what, how, what is your line going to be as a reflection of yourself? You know, your poetic line. There's no arbitrary line you must write to here. You write until you stop naturally and you pick it up. And you write, you stop naturally again, your breath. Where do you have to breathe? You know. So he says, the poem breaks down the restrictions of the literary closed verse, but even the form of its composition, reflecting newly the typewriter's use in creating a score. So the poem becomes a score. You know? And we always tell people, when we will, you know, this is just a score. You want to know what that poem sounds like? You have to have it read. You don't know from the page, you know. That's a score. Like you know, if you know music, you could look Duke, Duke Ellington stuff on the page, and you know. That, that. But to hear Duke live, you have to hear the band, you have to hear the orchestra, you know, to actually hear it. So he says, "Let me put it baldly: the head, by way of the ear, to the syllable; the heart, by way of the breath, to the line." That was his formula, as he says, the head by way of the ear. You hear it. You, it's in your head, but you hear what you're saying to the syllable, each syllable. Then the heart by way of the breath to the line, how long the line is, where it breaks off. Where it breaks off is how you read it. You don't know what it sounds like until you hear it. And why Maximus of Tyre, he projected himself from that persona, a fourth century Greek philosopher of ethics. Taken thinly, it is a costume of sorts, but deeper, the rejection of a particular way of seeing and thinking. That is Maximus, a fourth century Greek philosopher. Then Maximus is in Gloucester, you see, this philosopher of ethics in Gloucester. Uh, Herman Sonny Blount is from Birmingham, Alabama. 
when at the height of his mystical summoning of space, time, the heavens, angels, and demons into the music with such albums as The Magic City, we learn later that that was named after Birmingham. Birmingham's official subrogate is The Magic City. We didn't know that. We thought Sunrise had created something weird. But he was just talking about his hometown. Yeah. The Magic City. So that as Sun Ra, even the city of his birth could be given other amazing qualities. He has a parallel again, not a Gloucester, for, for Charles and Birmingham become magical places by the fact that they named them that. But the music, the music he created and the persona he had thrust into the world as Sun Ra. It is the parallels that tie Olson and Ra together that they both exert great influence over American art during the 50s until this day. Olson died in 1970, Sun Ra in 1993. In his preparatory development, Sun Ra, still Sonny Blunt, was an arranger and pianist with Fletcher Henderson. You see, Sun Ra was old. He was a pianist with Fletcher Henderson Orchestra, one of the cauldrons of early swing that would through the accretion of hipness give rise to the Duke Ellington great orchestral classicism and Count Basie's non vehicle of swing. So that Henderson was actually the on-the-job creator of the big jazz orchestra, and it was here that Ra received his on-the-job training, as they would say in the service. So we can take this as parallel to Olson's academic pursuits, his reading for his stretching out. By 1950, when Olson writes projective verse, is the same year that Sun Ra, who changes his name to resonate the ancient Egyptian sun god, that is, he has now moved away or forward from his schooling in Swing University, which Phil Shap still uses on WKCR, was revived at Lincoln Center, at least a somewhat mobile institution, to become a force of its own creation. In the late 40s, Olson had gone down to Black Mountain College to become its last rector, as Sun Ra was going to Chicago to begin his manifestation as Ra, when the first word of a cosmic jazz began to be heard. Albums like Sun Ra Visits Planet Earth, Interstellar Low Ways, Angels and Demons at Play, We Travel the Spaceways, which is a beautiful song, confirmed that it's more than a rumor that there is indeed a cosmic jazz and that it is holy Barack emanating from Chicago, which has been the capital of black America after move north from the Black Belt and Atlanta. Interesting. What is interesting is that Ra's whole projection is like a black mythology. He even called one of his orchestras, A-R-K, orchestras, Sun Ra and his Myth Science Orchestra. Olson and his use of his home Gloucester as a place to build a history and a mythology that in essence wanted to put, as he said, quote, put the hinges back on the door, unquote. So that we might go back and forth in a living history of space as well as time to begin to know ourselves and the place we are. I think I hear the spaceship now. <laughs> Did we ask to go somewhere? <laughs> <coughs> now, Ra would don a costume. In fact, by the time I first saw him and the orchestra in the 1960s, when he played, they were completely outfitted, as if from that vantage point, from outer space. He could see the planet and its people and its problems from a higher viewpoint. If Olson would speak from an ancient philosopher's persona, yet be rooted in the day-to-day -day livingness of Gloucester, Massachusetts, an old fishing village, which also fueled, fueled, and which he had been fueled by his passion for Melville, as well as his terror and resolve to remove himself from the evil of the white whale, U.S. imperialism. His pursuit had demented Ahab, and would destroy the ship named after Native Americans, the Pequot, and his multinational crew. So what, Charles, what Olson says here is his quote, in the midst of plenty, walk as close to bear. In the land of plenty, have nothing to do with it. Take the way of the lowest, including your legs. Go, contrary, go, sing. It's Maximus Song 3 now. That dude who wrote that book in Mexico, whatever his name is, 
saying that Olson was an imperialist. You just have to read that passage. Quote, in the midst of plenty, walk us close to bear. In the land of plenty, have nothing to do with it. Take the way of the lowest, including your legs. Go, contrary, go, sing. So that Olson would remove himself to the isolation and poverty of Gloucester, while Sun Ra would remove himself from the planet itself. <laughs> <laughs> What makes these stances so magnetic is the context of the 60s itself, that whole period in which Mao Zedong summed up as, quote, revolution is the main trend in the world today. Some pundit of the beats would describe this motion away from the mainstream as, quote, turn on, tune in, and drop out, unquote. In this case, there's a certain self-cultivation as well as self-anointment. But it was as close as the beats would come to the truth of leaving the craven concerns of straight up America. One of the most beautiful songs Sun Ra composed was, we travel the space, we travel the spaceways from planet to planet. They used to have a, they used to have these women and the band walk around, you know, the audience singing that song. We travel the spaceways from planet to planet. The music by this time was part of a whole pageant that Sun Ra presented. The members of the orchestra, like the Ark of the Noah, stepping, dancing, sometimes circling in their space costume. Two of his greatest musicians, Marshall Allen, who's still alive, plays the alto, and John Gilmore, tenor, at the forward end of the new music, Gilmore died a few months after Sun Ra. Alan is about to celebrate, I guess, his 87th year, still a leader of the avant-garde. The names of Sun Ra's orchestras changed as, for instance, Omniverse Orchestra, Solo Myth Orchestra, Outer Space Orchestra, Astro Infinity Orchestra, Blue Universe Orchestra, and on and on. Some 30 names I know of his orchestras through the years. 30 different changes. There's a book you can read called Omniverse, Sun Ra, by a German, Hartmut Gierken and Bernhard Hefle. Uh, wait a while, press, <laughs> Germany. <laughs> and what uh, Ra would say is changing names is exciting. <laughs> to be another other. <laughs> the cover of the new book of mine was new a couple of years ago called Digging, the Afro-American Soul of American Classical Music, University of California. On the front cover is the front of the Black Arts Repertory Theater School, circa 1965, which was located at 130th Street and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. And at that cover, you see me sitting at the bottom of the step, no, on the, bo on the bottom of the step rather than walk up, and I have a bag of refreshments. And uh, it's really that wine that don't come from grapes. It's <laughs> some other kind of wine. <laughs> and at the top of the crowd, it's staircase, because there's people standing around all the time. At the top of the staircase, you see Sun Ra standing there. He came to the school many times and played for us on one of four trucks. We used to send four trucks out every day music on one truck, graphic arts on another truck, poetry on another truck, drama, to play in vacant lots, parks, play streets, projects. Sun Ra and I talked almost every day. On Wednesday night, he would bring the orchestra and blow the place up. Ra was the first I had seen to use the synthesizer, which he called a space organ. <laughs> then he had a synthesizer with tubular lights put on it, and it shined bright colors for high notes and dark colors for low notes. This was the first light show I witnessed. <laughs> Sometime before Billy Graham copped in San Francisco and used for his rock shows. That's where they came from, you know. So you say, yeah, I'm going to space ways, you know, the lights be <laughs> It was in this context that Ra taught me and the others at the arts, notably Steve Young, who was our administrative backbone. He taught us his cosmic philosophy, but for me especially his understanding of language. Larry Neal, the great poet, never talked about. Larry Neal and I included Ra's poetry in the anthology, the Black Arts anthology we produced called Black Fire, 
reprinted in 2008 by Black Classic Press in Baltimore. The poetry and prose collected in what was called the immeasurable equation. Ra taught that a word is not only an idea, but a sound. It's not only an idea, a word, but a sound. It has force and power, and the way it sounded, Dig Olson, the way it sounded makes it open in the world of what it sounds like, and its many meanings manifest at once to the digger. When we first arrived in Harlem, I carried the black arts flag designed by painter William White. And what it is, interestingly enough, the frown at the top of the world, the smile at the bottom of the world. Those are the two masks. You see the two masks of art. They're always like that, you know. Cold, hot. <laughs> That's what it is. And so the first, there's a quote of mine given 10 years ago, now 12 years ago, on the back of a book by Harvard music historian John Zvade. He wrote a book called Space is the Place. And I, uh, my quote was, Sun Ra's consistent statement, musically and spoken, is that this is a primitive world its practices, beliefs, religion are uneducated, unenlightened, savage, destructive, already in the past. That's why Sun Ra returned only to say he left into the future, into space. Sun Ra's relentless admission that he really was from Saturn, that is not from here, <laughs> and that he was an angel, though sometimes he would say that if people going along with the corrupt earth systems were considered good, then he was a demon. When a German reporter confronted Sun Ra a few years ago saying, in effect, come on Sun Ra, tell the truth, you haven't really been to Jupiter. <laughs> Ra's answer was no, but I have been to Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> Ra and Olsen were perfect mentors for the most advanced artists of the 60s and still at this moment. To give a list of those artists he influenced is endless. But for instance, by Olsen, Robert Creeley, Edward Dorn, two outstanding. By Sun Ra, John Gilmore, Marshall Allen, and so many others. A great deal of time by both. It would be a who's who of great and important artists of the last part of the 20th century. We should go on that into detail in the next note. So that's the essay that I wrote on that. Thank you.